this next session, you'll see Hunter Davies being interviewed by Steve Axel. If you enjoy the session, take a selfie and share your digital festival experience on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram accounts to encourage your friends to join in too. So now, please give a virtual welcome to Hunter Davies. Hunter Davies, welcome to the Isle of Wight Digital Literary Festival uh, 2020. Sadly, uh, you haven't got a full audience here, but uh, you have a few of us to, uh, to hear what we uh, all want to hear about uh, the Isle of Wight and in a particular song. Right. The, uh, anyway, I'm very pleased to be here, sitting on my own, talking to myself. It's just like being at home. I was hoping to come to the Isle of Wight Literary Festival, the real flesh and blood one, later in, in October, but you're not having it this year for reasons we know. One of the reasons I wanted to come this year, I'm in the process of buying a house in the Isle of Wight. And we've made the offer, and it's been agreed. It's a Grade 2 listed house in Ryde, and it's two minutes from a three-mile stretch of sand. The beach is absolutely stunning and I can walk there on the flat. And of course I've always wanted to come here because of the reference to the Isle of Wight and a very famous Beatles song. And I last came here last month in 1966. And I came to interview, I was on the Sunday Times writing a column, and I came to interview the governor of Parkhurst. I can't remember how I got there and I think at the time the Cray brothers, or some famous criminals, infamous criminals, were incarcerated on the Isle of Wight, and I came to interview the governor. God knows why, he must have, they don't usually agree to publicity, but I came to interview him, and we came with a photographer, and I was looking through my files last week, and I found a photograph of me sitting on the boat with the wooden decking, and the wooden, uh, this is 1966, and wooden benches, and I'm sitting looking really, I was aged sort of 22 or 24, looking really dopey and abstracted. I remember now the photographer told me later he'd take the photograph of me, unbeknown to me, and gave it to me. So Steve, I might send it to you later. And you could see I was last there. So we bought this house and we're going to make it, we're going to be living here, we'll help most of the year. And of course the other big attraction is the Beatles, two of the Beatles songs, one definitely refers to Isle of Wight, and one people think it refers to Isle of Wight. And the song Ticket to Ride, uh, obviously it's R-I-D-E, and a lot of people have written, when I did my book all those years ago, there only were two other books up at the Beatles. Now there's 2,000 people, and people around the world are doing be doing PhDs researching it. And in this uh, ticket to Ride, John and Paul had actually been to Ride, the town of Ride, but we, nobody's been able to find the exact date. And they, Paul's uncle was running a bar in Ride. And he was previously running a bar, a bar in Caversham, which is, I think, in Berkshire. And they came down there when they were still at school, 15, 16, and they played in this bar in Caversham, and they called themselves the Nurk Twins, N-E-R-K. God knows what they did. Nobody recorded it. And it looks as if they repeated it when the uncle moved to the bar in Ride. So they had been, but the song Ticket to Ride doesn't mean that. And the song is about a girl who's going her own way, and she's ignoring them and going off. John later told somebody that the phrase ticket to ride, he first heard it in Hamburg, you know the Beatles played in Hamburg, and the, when the street walkers, the girls on the streets are in the, the brothels, because uh, it was all organised and they had to be medically certified in order to sell their bodies back in the 1960s. And when they had been certified, they had a ticket to ride. And that was the phrase, the ticket to ride. You can go off now and work down the streets. John used to say it was really the first heavy metal song, which it's not. Two Americans have analysed it, and they say it's the first psychedelic song, and I don't believe that at all. 
So a ticket to ride, people use that joke all the time, and it's not ride in the Isle of Wight. But the other song, When I'm 64. When I'm 64 has, uh, I've got the words here. I've done a book called The Beatles Lyrics, and I tracked down the original handwritten manuscripts and that's the original handwritten manuscript by Paul of When I'm 64. And it's got a bit damp and it's got a bit funny and the ink has run and obviously water's gone on it sometime. And he's made one change. I'm waiting for you to you sincerely wasting away. The thing about this, the words of this song, I was going to sing it, I can't sing the top it. When I get older, losing my hair, many years from now, bum, bum, bum. Could you just sing along with me? I hope everybody at home will know the words and will sway. Will you be sending me Valentine, birthday greetings, bottle of wine? I'd, I'd be out till quarter of three. Would you lock the door? Will you need me? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Doing the garden, digging the weeds. Who could ask for more? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Every summer we can rent a cottage in the Isle of Wight. If it's not too dear, we shall scrimp and save grandchildren on your knee. Sorry, I'll sing that line again. Grandchildren on your knee. Because for some reason, Paul puts a Scottish accent on on the word your. Vera, Chuck and Dave, send me a postcard, drop me a line, stating point of view. Isn't that a clever word? It's a pun. Stating point of view means two things. It means it's the postcard, so there's a view, a pictorial view. And stating point of view also means give me an observation. Isn't that good? And there's another really good line. You don't realise how witty they were. I could be handy, many a fuse. When your lights have gone. Now isn't that witty? Paul wrote this song when he was 16. And the whole music of it is a pastiche of a 1920s, 1930s uh, music hall song. And that was the sort of music he was brought up with because his father, Jim, had a jazz band and he played the trumpet. His dad was very musical. So when Paul was a little boy, this was the sort of music he was brought up with. His dad playing for the family, his dad doing things. And Paul, like Jim, can play any instrument. So they, he wrote this song when he was very young, when he at first met John, but there were no words to it. But they liked the, the uh, parody. So when they were... In the early days of the uh, Quarrymen, that was our first group, in the early days of the Beatles, when they were giving a concert somewhere, playing early rock and roll or skiffle, when they were mucking around on stage, and perhaps there's older people in the audience, they would play When I'm 64. But he didn't really have the words of it at the time. It was only later. And he did it on the Sgt Pepper album, when I was doing the book, in 1967. And if you think about the words, he is a boy of 22, 23, and he is imagining being 64. And that is so mature and wise. And he imagined all the things, will you still need me? Will you still feed me? By a huge chance, I was in Liverpool at the time, and I was staying with his father, Jim McCartney. And Jim McCartney, Paul's mother died, she was a midwife. And she died when he was about 15 and 16. She had breast cancer. And Paul's dad brought up Paul and his younger brother, Michael, on his own. And now he's, the two boys have gone. And he then meets a woman called, oh God, what's she called? Not Heather. I've written it down somewhere. Anyway, he marries her. And the boys, Paul and Michael, are not pleased, he's remarried in his 60s. 30 years later, history repeats itself when Paul marries Heather Mills. Paul's children didn't like Heather. 
just as he, 30 years later, anyway, when I was with Jim that weekend, uh, the acetate, acetate is a sort of a proof version of a new record, and it arrived in the post, and Jim had just become 64, and Paul pretended he'd written it for him, and we played the music, I was staying, slept the night in the, in the house, Paul had brought this really posh house to them in the Wirral. He bought them a racehorse and he bought them a posh house in the Wirral, which is very like the house that we're just buying and ride. It was a Victorian splendid house with uh, grade two listed. It had a conservatory. And I danced all evening, because I was quite young at the time, with his wife to When I'm 64, over and over again. Right, so how did I come to do the book? In 1966, I was 29, 30, and I was on the Sunday Times, and I've been on the Sunday Times since 1960, and for the first two or three years on the Sunday Times, I didn't get my name in the paper. I was the assistant on a column called the Atticus Column, and the Atticus Column is still going, but it's obviously not as good as it was in my day, and we had a whole page of interviews, and I was the boy assistant. Previous people who had written the Atticus column was John Buchan, Ian Fleming, Sir Chevrolet Sitwell, the head of the Sitwells family, and we, uh, one of the legends when I worked on it was Sir Chevrolet Sitwell, wrote a piece in the column about five or ten years later, he'd been on holiday in Portugal, and he wrote a little paragraph, because it was a part, partly personal, but mainly just interviewing well-known people, and he said, I've just been to Portugal and I had a most amazing drink that I'd never come across before called Matthias Rosé. And this was the first reference in print, in English, of Matthias Rosé. And he got a free crate for life as long as he was alive. Because the Matthias Rosé people... So that was a legend I picked up. I thought, I wonder if I can, I can give a plug to something. So in 1966... I had eventually taken over the column and I, I wasn't going to do posh people anymore. I wasn't going to do pieces which I've been writing for years about who will be the next Archbishop of Canterbury, as if I cared, who will be the next ambassador in New York, who will be whoever. I wanted to do gritty northern novelists. I wanted to do pop stars. I wanted to do footballers. I wanted to do fashion designers. This was 1964 when I took it over, and the 60s didn't really begin until 1964. And I felt, until then, prejudiced against for my northern provincial background. But suddenly, people like me became the flavour of the times, and everybody wanted to... My obsessions became everybody's obsessions. So I did George Best, I did John Brain, and in 1966 I had Eleanor Rigby, and I thought the words of Eleanor Rigby were absolutely stunning. You know that, that line, uh, waits at the window, wearing a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. That is the most a brilliant line, wearing a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. That is so clever and is so visual and yet it's mysterious. So I heard the words of Eleanor Rigby and I thought... Who was Eleanor Rigby? This is 1966, and it just come out. And I actually thought it'll be the best, those are the best poetry, the best verse of this year, 1966, as if I know anything about poetry. And so I thought, I'll go and see Paul and not talk about... So I fixed an interview with him in St John's Wood, Cavendish Avenue, in the house he still owns. He just moved in because Paul is a conservative with a small C and hasn't moved house all that time, he's moved elsewhere. And I went to see him in that house, and I wasn't going to ask him the two questions in 1966 that all journalists were asking him was, why have you got that funny haircut? You've got to put your mind back. And why do you spell Beatles that funny way? And I wanted to know where the song had come from. And that is my column. Have I got time to read you the interview? Yes? Yes. The thing about it, this is 1966, and I, I described 
September the 18th, 1966, my first interview with Paul. I call him Mr. McCartney and Mr. Lennon, because the, the Sunday Times in 1960, uh, I wore a suit all the time, and it was oak panels, and we had the Sloney secretary, everybody had a secretary, it was very... Paul McCartney was in his new mansion in St. John's Wood. He lives alone, and Mr. and Mrs. Kelly look after him. Nothing so formal as housekeeper and butler. Their job, he says, is just to fit in. The house has a huge wall and an electrically operated black door to keep out non-beetle life. Inside, there is some carefully chosen elderly furniture. Nothing flash, nothing flash affected or even expensive looking. The dining room table was covered with a white lace tablecloth, very working class posh. Mr. McCartney, along with Mr. Lennon, is the author of a song called Eleanor Rigby. No pop song of the moment has better words or music. Quote, this is Paul talking. I was sitting at the piano when I thought of it, just like Jimmy Durante. You've never heard of Jimmy Durante. The first few bars just came to me and I got the name in my head, Daisy Hawkins picks up the rice in the church where a wedding, a wedding has been. I don't know where the words came from. I can't hear a whole song in one chord. In fact, I think you can hear, sorry, I can hear a whole song in one chord. Isn't that interesting? In fact, I think you can hear a whole song in one note if you listen hard enough, but nobody ever listens hard enough. Okay, that's the Joan of Arc bit. I couldn't think of much more, so I put it away for a day. Then the name Father McCartney came to me and all the lonely people. But I thought people would think it was supposed to be my dad sitting knitting his socks and my dad's a happy lad. So I went through the telephone book and I eventually got the name Mackenzie. I was in Bristol when I decided Daisy Hawkins wasn't a good name. He was in Bristol because he was going out with Jane Asher, to whom he was engaged, and she was acting in a play in Bristol. Uh, he was in Bristol, and I decided Daisy Hawkins wasn't a good name, so I walked around looking at the shops, and I saw the name Rigby. You've got that quick pan to Bristol. This is Paul mocking himself, talking like this, and giving directions. I can just see this all as a Hollywood musical. I took it round to John's house in Weybridge. We sat around laughing, got stoned, and finished it off. I thought of the backing, but it was George Martin who finished it off. I just go bash, bash, bash on the piano, and he knows what I mean. All our songs come out of our imagination. There never was an Eleanor Rigby. One of us, this actually is the first interview in any paper in the world about how he'd written a song. It's 1966. One of us might think of a song completely and the other just out of it, or we might write alternate lines. We never argue. If one of us says he doesn't like it, but the other agrees, it doesn't matter that much. I care about being a songwriter, but I don't care passionately about each song. Eleanor is a big development as a composition but that doesn't mean Yellow Submarine is bad. Anyway, I won't tell you the rest of it, but that's the, the interview that I did, and it goes on. If you like, I can put it... This is my copyright. We can put this online as well, so you can see the... This is archive stuff. So I did the interview, and I wrote... In that particular line about me saying, I think it'd be the best words in poetry, I got a fan letter from our rival newspaper from Kenneth Tynan, Kenneth Tynan was the most eminent theatre critic of the time. And he was, there was only two papers in those days. There was no mail on Sunday. There was no Sunday Telegraph. And we were in debt. And Kenneth Tynan wrote me a letter saying, I totally agree with you. The words of Ellen Rigby are absolutely brilliant. Six months later, I had, by then, even though I was a working journalist and was married and... My wife and I were both sitting at home trying to write books. 
And I've had a novel published called He Would Go Around the Mulberry Bush. It was my first novel, and lo and behold, it was bought by Hollywood for a movie. And I was working on the script, the screenplay. And I went with the, and the director of it, called Clive Donner, who's just done What's New Pussycat, and he did Harold, Pen Harold Pinter film, I think The Birthday Party, something like that. He wanted Paul to do the theme tune for my movie. So six months later, Clive and I went to Paul's house, the same house, and we were asking him, will you write the theme tune for this film? And he vaguely thought about it. He'd done, he'd done a couple of theme tunes for films. And in the end, he didn't do it. But while we were there, and I told him about the film, and we were chatting, I said to him, there should be a proper hardback book about the Beatles, about your life. I was a fan. I'm roughly two or three old years older than him, but I went to the same sort of grammar school in the north of England, and I went exactly the same sort of council house that George and Paul went to. John was a posher. John lived in a semi, and Ringo, we don't talk about Ringo, Ringo lived in the slums and never went to school. <laughs> he was always poorly. And Paul said that there'd only be two books about the Beatles. One was the fan club book, and one was by an American, which is a book of interviews with them on an American tour. I said there should be a proper hardback serious biography. So the rest of your life, when people ask you the same old boring questions, you can say, it's in the book. And he said, brilliant idea, but you've got to get permission from Brian Epstein. This is 1966. And there and then, because Paul's a PR, Paul sat me down and told me the sort of wording and the arse licking I should do in a letter to Brian. So I wrote a letter to Brian saying who I am. And this, one, I think, was my second book. And I was on the staff of the Sunday Times. I sent him my card. And he agreed to see me. And he counselled three times. I thought, oh, bloody hell, it's never going to come off. At the time, we never knew, the world never knew he was gay. And the world never knew he was a masochistic homosexual. He would pick up boys who were not gay, like soldiers or sailors, give them drinks and drugs, bring them back to his house, try to get them in bed, and they would punch him because they weren't gay. And that was his pleasure, being beaten up. And then they would leave and they'd usually steal money or steal acetates, and he would wake up covered with remorse and shame and embarrassment, and he would take drugs to get himself to sleep, and he'd be zonked out for two or three days. Anyway, I eventually got to see him. He was two years older than me. He lived in Belgravia and must have he had a butler. A lovely house. And he was so charming and so well dressed. I felt a real scruff and I felt so young and naive and provincial. He was from Liverpool, but he'd gone to a public school and he'd gone to RADA and he, until he met the Beatles, his passion in life was Sibelius. And the real reason, I think, why he went to the Cavern Club, because in, by 1966, most people in the media and in pop music knew he was gay, but it was against the law. And I think he was fascinated by John Lennon, who wasn't gay, gyrate, gyrating on stage. People used to think he must fancy Paul, because Paul is pretty. But it was John, he was, so he became that agent. So we, I told him my idea, and he said, excellent. And I made a phone call, because I told my publisher, Heinemann, I've got this interview, and if, and if he agrees, my agent can come and do the deal there and then. And he said, fine. And I was at a very famous agency, which still exists, called Curtis Brown. That's the biggest agency. And I rang my man, who's a young man of my age, who looked after me, and he said, Curtis wants to come. I said, who's Curtis? Curtis, sorry, Spencer Curtis Brown. 
began the firm. And he was an old man who came out of retirement. And he came to, I'm going to tell you the name of the street in a minute, he came to Belgravia and we discussed it. And Brian uh, inserted a clause in the book which we'd never asked for. We'd never thought about it. We didn't demand it. Uh, we were, uh, I was getting from Heinemann, this is 1966, the fee was £3,000, bugger all. And I was going to give it to NEMS, the Beatles company, a third of it. Anyway, Brian said, I'll tell you what, uh, we'll put a clause in saying, I, Brian Epstein, will give no access to the Beatles, to any other writer, until two years after your book comes out. So we're talking in 1966. My book came out in 1968. Two years after that, 1960, 1970, the Beatles were no more. They'd split. So my book became the only ever authorised biography of the Beatles. But I never knew when I was writing it that that was the case. I imagine every four or five years that there'd be another biographer. I imagine they would stay together. When I did the deal with Heinemann, one of the reasons why the money was not all that brilliant was a lot of people in 1966 were saying, the bubble will burst, the Beatles are finished. We know everything we need to know about them. And I, I could already see them developing and advancing. And suddenly one of the directors said, pop music doesn't sell. Cliff Richard's done his book and nobody's buy it. I said, it's not just pop music, it's social history. Social history? Who needs social history? I forgot to say, when I went into Brian's house, he just had from the Beatles the acetate, that's the proof record, of Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. And I listened to Penny Lane, and Penny Lane is a bit like when I'm 64, it's a pastiche of an old music hall thing. But the other side was Strawberry Fields Forever. And I thought, my God, that is absolutely incredible. I'd never heard anything like that. And that convinced me, I want to do this book, because that convinced me they were moving on. It was psychedelic. Most of the words didn't make sense. And they were drug related. And I said to Brian, what's it about? He said, I didn't know. I said, but Strawberry Fields, what's Strawberry Fields? Nobody knew at the time, Strawberry Fields was a Salvation Army hostel in Liverpool where John, when he was a little boy, used to climb over the wall and go in the grounds. And that's Strawberry Fields. And he was from Liverpool, Brian Epstein, but he didn't know what it was. So when I heard that music being played, uh, I realised that they'd moved on so far from Love, Love Me Do. So I got the contract. I started doing, I worked for the first year still doing the Sunday Times. I used the Sunday Times to go to Hamburg. So I decided they were the most famous people in the world at the time. They were followed everywhere. People were screaming. They couldn't go anywhere with that. And I thought they must have had the same boring question. So I spent roughly the first six months not really talking to them, going to the studio, but not cross-examining them. I thought, I'll go back from whence they have come. So I went to uh, Liverpool and I interviewed all their parents, the ones that were alive. Paul's mother had died, I mentioned that earlier, he died when he was 15, and John's mother had died, but Paul's dad was alive, George's parents were alive, Ringo's parents were alive, and I interviewed school teachers, and I went to their houses and they'd been moved into posh bungalows and in different parts of Liverpool and they were totally ostracised because they didn't know the bankers and the doctors and the people, lawyers next door and they were still couldn't believe what had happened. A lot of the furniture was still in plastic and they were scared stiff of their sons, Ringo's parents and George, because they didn't want to say anything that would get in the papers and that their sons would scream them. What? The same thing happens today with celebrities. You're all chasing the relations. Look at Meghan Markle's father. She must be so pissed off at all the interviews the father has given. So they were, and what was funny to me was that they, 
The children were boshing round the parents. They bought the house and controlling them. So the father, as the words of the thing, the, uh, I'll forget, I'll remember it in a minute. Mimi, who brought up John, she had just left Liverpool. Mimi was, her husband had died, but they brought up John when John's parents split and living in a semi-detached house called Mendibs in Liverpool. And she, one day, about a couple of years earlier, she heard a noise in the night and she heard the front door opening. She left the door open because she was expecting the GP to come and look at it. And she came downstairs and there were two teenage girls sitting going through her sewing basket. She was a very strong bossy woman. What are you doing? Who said you'd come in? Oh, we're just looking for some buttons that might have been in John's coat. And she thought, that's it, I'm leaving Liverpool. I can't stand it. And she moved to near Bournemouth, Carnford Cliffs. Have you heard of Carnford Cliffs? That's the multimillionaire opposite, near Bournemouth. It's where all the fame. So I went to interview her there. She just moved into the bungalow. This is Mimi. And it was a lovely sunny day. And we sat out at the back of her bungalow, overlooking the, the sea, the river. And there was a, a pleasure boat going up. And across the water, we could hear a noise on a megaphone saying, Look left, ladies and gentlemen, and you'll see John Lennon's Aunt Mimi sitting on her balcony. And she went absolutely spare. Closed the door and we rushed inside. In Liverpool, I went to see Pete Best. The Beatles in the Quarrymen, and the Beatles when they were in Hamburg, and the Beatles when they got the first, first met George Martin and did the first version of Love Me Do, had a drummer called Pete Best. And Pete Best got the push just from the Becoming Famous, and Ringo got the job. So Pete Best just took the height from becoming multi-millionaires. He'd been with them for two or three years. He'd helped, their mother had helped them in the early days because she had a sort of teenage uh, youth club where they did play things. And he was there in Hamburg. And for a long time, the mother, who was called Mona, wouldn't give me an interview. She said, you're going to just do pro Beatles. I said, no, it's my book. It's not, I'm not ghosting an autobiography. It's my book and my words. And they're just giving me access. I just want to hear, you can't see Pete. So I spoke to the mother and I said, look, I'll let you read whatever I write about you in the book. I just want to know how you found the Beatles, how you helped them, and she did help them, the Casbah. She ran a club called the Casbah, which was in the cellar of her big house in Liverpool. And Pete became the drummer. But Pete doesn't want to see you. And then she said, OK, then. And a side door opened, and Pete had been in the next room all the time, listening. And he was wearing, his face was all covered with flower dust, and he was wearing a white coat. He'd just come off the night shift in a bread slicing factory, where he was getting toppings an hour, while the Beatles were all millionaires, and lived buying Rolls Royces and buying posh houses. And there was Pete. And Pete got the sack. And Pete was looked upon, Pete had a massive fan club following in Liverpool, and Pete was looked upon the handsome one, whereas Ringo was looked upon as ugly, because Ringo is not exactly uh, uh, whatever. And he never spoke to the Beatles since, and he still hadn't spoken to Paul. So, but he wasn't, uh, after this, a few years later, he joined the civil service, he got a good job, he had a career, he got married, in fact, of all the four Beatles, he's the only one who, st who stayed with the same wife to this day. It wasn't that they left their wives the way Ringo and George and John did, and Paul's died. It was, they, they moved on. So I then went to Hamburg. They had, over a spell of two years, they had lots of trips to Hamburg. And really they honed their sound in Hamburg, working in this club, playing all night long. They actually found they were from Liverpool by going to Hamburg. Like James Joyce went to Paris to write about Dublin. You need to be away to know where you're from. In Hamburg, they had another member, the 
a group called Stuart Sutcliffe. And he was the best friend at art college of John. And Stuart was a very good artist and he just won a prize, the John Moores Prize. And with his prize money, John made him buy a guitar. So they, there were five of them, George, Paul and John, Pete Best and Stuart Sutcliffe. They were the early Beatles there and they played night and day. In Liverpool, by playing at the Cavern Club, the fan base was, I must choose my words carefully, were mainly working girls, hairdressers, secretaries. When they moved to Hamburg, they went up a slight social notch. All their fans in Hamburg were art students at the university or the college, so they had a different... Anyway, Stuart fell in love with a girl called Astrid Kirchner, who was an art student and a photographer, and she gave them their beetle hair. When they went to Hamburg, they had a rock and roll teddy boy haircut, a DA it was called, and she actually made them some of their clothes, and most of all, she took the most amazing photographs of them. She just died last month, Astrid, and she was a stunning, she looked a bit like Bridget Bardo. She had very blonde hair and very attractive. And she took these photographs off them, which I still think to this day are the best photographs ever taken. And it's the five of them in a sort of empty fairground. I've got a whole set of them in my house, signed by Astrid to me. I went to see her in 1966, because what happened was, after the Beatles came back, she and Stuart got engaged, and the Beatles went back to Liverpool. They came back a few times, but he, Stuart left the group and settled in Hamburg. And he was only there a couple of months, when over a weekend he had a brain hemorrhage and died. Stuart had that, sorry, Stuart died and Astrid had gone back to her family apartment in Hamburg. And I went to see her in 1966, two years, and she was still in mourning for Stu. Her room was black carpets, black wallpaper, and she was wearing black. She was still mourning for the loss of Stu. And she had no money, and she was working in a lesbian club at the bar. And if people, a female lesbian, well, obviously, and if people had no partners, they would dance with Astrid. I went down to see the bar, and she was doing this job while sitting on these amazing photographs which nobody had seen. So I interviewed her, and I did the... I, I thought she was absolutely marvellous. So I came back to London, having been to Liverpool, having met Pete Best, and having met Astrid, whom they hadn't seen. And then I started going to Paul's house in Cavendish Avenue. We'd have breakfast together, and then we'd go in the studio, and they were recording the whole of Sergeant Pepper, so I listened to the whole of Sergeant Pepper. And then I'd do interviews, but it was only then I started sitting them down face to face, and I started by telling them what I'd been doing. The minute I mentioned Pete Best, they changed the subject. And John said, we're not talking about him, we were bastards. Not because we sacked him, it's because we didn't do the dirty work. We got Brian to say, the Beatles don't want you anymore. We should have faced them up, but they were fascinated by Astrid. But I've just told you about Astrid. They had no idea. They remembered her, but hadn't been. They've been round the world since then. Don't forget on tour and in a little capsule. So I then spent roughly a year, and my normal thing. I still live in the same house in North London, beside the Heath, and Paul lived just ten minutes away in St John's Wood, round the corner from. So I used to go about 11 in the morning and I would see Paul and join him for breakfast. He was a single man. Jane Asher lived in Wimpole Street or Wigmore Street and we would have a fry-up. When I see him now, which I do quite frequently, he denies he used to have bacon and egg and ham and sausage because he's a veggie. He's wiped it from his mind. He was like everybody else. And then he had a big English sheepdog called Martha. And he wrote a song about Martha. Martha, my dear, don't forget me. Everybody thinks Martha was a girl, but it was a dog. And then we'd go in his little souped-up Mini Cooper, and we'd drive with the dog to Primrose Hill. 
I remember going up Primrose Hill with Paul and Martha, and it was the first day of spring like spring, and the daffodils were coming out, and the sun was getting nicer. And I said to Paul, it's getting better, and I meant the weather, spring is coming. And he started laughing and said, you've got to admit it's getting better. I said, why are you laughing at that phrase? It's a corny cliche. He said, when we were in Australia on our tour, Ringo fell ill. And they flew out a reserve drummer called Jimmy Nickel and uh, for two or three gigs Jimmy was playing and sitting there and after every concert John would turn to Jimmy and say how's it going Jimmy and Jimmy only said for the month he was with them the same thing it's getting better it's getting better and they used to get the piss out of him so they loved it we went back to Paul's house Paul went up to his studio got his guitar and his piano and started singing the first four lines you've got to admit it's getting better it's getting better all the time and when John came round that evening they were working three months solid on Sergeant Pepper they had stopped performing in public only in the recording studio sometimes they sat and wrote a song together side by side other times they wrote a song 90% on their own uh, when they met before going in the studio they would play it to the other person so John Paul said I've got this half a song and he played it to having just composed it with me he played it to John and John said I can see his face now absolutely blank face showing no expression and John added another verse about I've been cruel to my woman I must look at those lines and John was actually cruel to Cynthia didn't really know he used to hit Cynthia appalling <coughs> so they wrote the song went in the studio and knocked it into shape during the so I saw about four or five songs I remember uh, a little help from my friends I remember them writing that. I remember them having a line saying, and I misheard it. It was, they'd written, waiting for the, the man to come. Who's the man? I don't know. I said, I thought you had actually written, waiting for the van to come. And when I was a boy in Carlisle, if somebody was appearing strange and stupid, the expression my mother used, the van will come for you or waiting for the van to come to take you away to the loony bin so they changed it to waiting for the van to come they thought it was a better strange wording then well, and, uh, um, I know that you can talk um, all day about the Beatles and, uh, and fascinating, fascinating uh, background um, finally for us um, it's over 50 years ago since that biography uh, many many songs have gone under the bridge as it were looking back and you had to redo it again, what would you change? What would you add? I, would, I actually saw so ma- observed so many songs being written. And these songs were being written when they hadn't recorded them, and I didn't know where they were going. I wish I'd written more. I've done two chapters about the songs. I remember going to see John once, and it turned out in Weybridge, and I arrived, he said, I'm not talking. I said, what? It's a day for not talking. I thought, oh, God, bloody hell. So Cynthia made us breakfast, not talking. And then we went to the swimming pool, not talking. I thought, I've come all this way. It was really, it was drugs related. Anyway, as we were swimming around the swimming pool, we heard a police siren down below in the village of Weybridge. And the police siren was going, as they still do today, ah, And as we were going around the pool, John played, it's not a tune, it's a rhythm. John started playing with, ah, and we went back in the house and he developed him to, ah, 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 and that became Across the Universe. So I heard so many of these songs beginning, so I wish I'd done more about it. The other thing I regret is that I uh, didn't use a tape recorder. On the Sunday Times, I had done a few tape recordings. I did W.H. Auden, the famous poet, 
and I had a tape recorder which was the size of this desk and I couldn't get it to work and I thought, bugger it, I'm not doing a tape recorder. So I did everything with them that you and I are talking now in a little red notebook and I wrote it down what they were saying. So I have 50 red notebooks and next month they're going to the British Library. If you go to the British Library and go in the manuscript room, you will see on the wall nine original songs handwritten by the Beatles. When I was with them, I started off, I, I said, can you give me some examples of your handwriting? Because as I'm going around the world meeting people, and they'll say, I've got a letter from John, I'll be able to. And then also, sitting in Abbey Road, at the end of the evening, there was these scraps of paper on the floor. And they might write it out several times, because Ringo would arrive late, and they'd say, Ringo, this is what we're doing this evening. And they just left those scraps of paper on the floor, because the whole point of being in the recording studio was to record it. And these are lads of 20. They could see no reason to keep these scraps of paper, because they got it down recording. And I would now and again say, if I heard a song all the way through, I'd say, can I have this? And say, yeah, keep it, because the cleaners will burn it. So about 10, 15 years later, when Sotheby started selling the first Beatles thing, I looked through my archives, my children were teenagers by then, and I turned out I had nine original Beatles lyrics, and this is the biggest collection in the world. The second biggest is in a university in America. And I rang the British Museum and I said, would you like them? And I thought they might turn it down. When the British Library opened, they're in the British Library today. So you go in the British Library, you go in the manuscript room, past Magna Carta, because that's boring and it's in Latin, past Wordsworth and Beethoven, and there's a panel of Beatles things. And when the Queen opened the British Library, I wasn't there, I was in the Lake District, the Queen didn't read Magna Carta, because it's in many years of Latin, but she stood a long time reading the words of yesterday, which is my copy, and I've given them to the nation, all my archives. Well, Hunter Davies, thanks very much for, for joining us here on the digital version of the Literary Festival. You're obviously a Beatles nut, and have been for, for 60 years. I've written 100 books, and when I was talking to you there, I couldn't believe that the name Jimmy Nickel came back to me. I haven't used his name across my lips. So it's 60 years since that book. Is it 60 years? 1960? 50 years oh. since that book came out. And I've done a couple of other books. I've done a book on the Beatles lyrics. I've done a book on John Lennon letters. But I've written all these other books on totally different things. So I'm not an expert. The world is full of experts. The further we get from the Beatles, the bigger they become. And there are people all over the world who know far more than me. Our thanks to Hunter Davies. Thank you very much for participating in the Red Funnel Isle of Wight Digital Literary Festival. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation. Follow the Donate Now button from the homepage of our website. You can also benefit from great discounts by ordering via Blackwell's Bookshop from our homepage. We'd like to thank the loyal sponsors who've supported the Isle of Wight Literary Festival over the past years. Without their financial contribution, it would be difficult to attract the many wonderful speakers we've hosted, while keeping ticket prices down. This year, their support has enabled us to provide the digital festival free of charge. Special thanks to Red Funnel, who've been our title sponsor for many years, and as well as providing financial support, offer a warm welcome to speakers and visitors to the island for the festival.